Um, so I was mentioning before I was going to talk a little bit about lens uh, choices and the differences between some of the different lenses. Um, so we were talking about you know wide angles versus um, telephoto lenses, um, but one of the things that people don't really think about is it's not just you know a relative uh, to your distance to the subject, but it's also relative to um, what the background is. So if you think about it, if I was to take a really wide angle lens and photograph something that's really close to me, let's say this the screen is my background and my subject is right here. If I if I shoot from this distance, I can include that whole screen with a wide view. But if I move to the back of the room and use a telephoto lens and still frame that object in the, at, for the same size in my, in my viewfinder, the background now is going to, my view basically will close down to like this. And so that I'll have less of that background in my view. And I do think I have a couple of examples where it shows that. But um, So basically if you have a background that you don't really want to see all the details of, if you back yourself away and zoom in, two things are going to happen. You're going to compress that background and see less of it. But also, what I was mentioning before, uh, with a telephoto lens, you kind of have this inherent uh, depth of field that changes to a sl uh, shallower depth of field as you um, go to a longer zoom lens, or a longer lens. It doesn't have to be zoom. It could be a, a prime lens. But um, So what ends up happening is you blur out that background. So it's kind of another way to kind of take away from distracting background. I do have some examples of that. Um, and then just quick lingo for anybody who doesn't know. A zoom lens versus a prime lens. A prime lens is basically a lens that doesn't have any zoom. It's just a fixed focal length lens. And the biggest difference is um, the prime lenses typically are uh, two things. They're usually sharper than a zoom lens that would be able to shoot at that same focal distance. And um, they also usually have the ability to shoot at a uh, bigger aperture, at a lower f-stop. So like for example, this is a 24 to 70 f2.8 lens. Um, you can buy, a t and this is about as big of an aperture as you can get for a lens like this, but you can buy a 24 millimeter f1.4 lens. Uh, you just couldn't get it in a zoom. So it's, they just, they can't make lenses that have that good of an aperture and also have the zoom. Um, good example is the 50 millimeter lens. You know, you can get, um, I think Sigma makes a 50 to 500 millimeter lens. And when I first started doing photography, I was tempted to buy this lens. It was, it's over $1,000, but my thought was, well, I get this 50 to 500, and all I have to worry about is the wide angle shots, and I've got everything that I would need ever. And then I began to realize that a couple of things happens. Um, not only can I not shoot at those wider apertures, uh, but there's a trade off to these zoom lenses. And typically, if you think of a zoom, or sometimes they call uh, like super zooms, where they're like, you know, the 50 to 500 is a good example. You get these really, really long focal uh, range zoom lenses. The quality is just not going to be as good throughout that whole area. There's, there's usually a, an area where they're decent, and then like with these the super zooms, as you go to the far end, where let's say between 200 and 500 in that case, they get considerably softer and, and um, the quality drops off quite a bit a lot of times. So, um, so it's kind of a trade-off. Sometimes it's really convenient to have a single lens you can walk around with, and it does everything you want to do as far as framing goes. Um, and not have to worry about changing lenses and carrying the extra weight. And for traveling and things, sometimes that's nice. But keep in mind that you're not going to be able to get that shallow depth of field. You're not going to be able to shoot in low light, and you're not going to have the, the clarity, the sharpness that you're going to be able to get from a, with a prime lens that you would get with one of these zoom lenses. So when you're out shooting, um, you know, lens selection also helps you to determine like how you're framing and how you're, you're selecting what portions of your image to shoot. And again, you can't, you have to kind of think photographically because you can't zoom with your eyes. So you can't look across the water and say, oh, I love that, that osprey nest. And if I zoomed in with my eyes, I could see, you know, the details and, and take away the background of whatever else. So you have to just kind of think about the fact that you can zoom in and take away the fact that there's actually a, a, a day mark there. It's, it just could be anywhere, you know. It kind of makes it feel a little bit more less, you know, um, with man's intrusion upon nature or whatever by doing a shot like this. But there's times where you couldn't use a, a, a zoom lens and move yourself back. In this case, this is um, a 10 and a half millimeter fisheye lens. The camera is sitting through the steering wheel right where my speedometer is. And there's no other way to get this kind of a shot other than to use a really wide angle. But the thing that, to keep in mind here is that the distortion you're getting from using that wide lens, I mean, it looks like my hand is about 10 times as big as my, uh, my head. And uh, so the wide angle lenses do cause distortion and the wider you go, you can get quite a bit more distortion. I have some more photos to show that as an example. And the interesting thing on the other end, I was shooting with an 18 to 200 millimeter lens here. And that's one of those lenses where it is kind of like a super zoom lens. You know, I could shoot wide, I can shoot telephoto. And um, I was shooting my friend here. This is the same guy from before, but it's just a different lens at the time. 
And then I realized that his glasses had such a good reflection that if I zoomed in, I could actually see not only myself, but everybody on the front of the boat as well. So I thought that was an interesting way, again, just changing the perspective, uh, same exact subject, but cropping it differently, you know, shooting it a little bit differently, and then all of a sudden it tells a whole different story, really. It's almost like this is the view from the skipper's, you know, the skipper's point of view kind of a thing. So this is um, just a, a real quick example with a point and shoot camera that I wanted to show. This is, um, it's uh, just to show the distortion you're gonna be getting. And again, this is kind of the, uh, the extremes of it a little bit. This is, again, a point and shoot camera doesn't have a really long telephoto or a really wide view. But what it does, uh, what this is showing is that if the camera is pulled all the way back and then zoomed all the way in, um, you can see the background is uh, more compressed. There's less of it being seen compared to if I move the camera to its widest setting and then I walk myself all the way in until his head fills the same framing. And now all of a sudden his, he looks distorted and the background, there's, you know, you'll see the car in the back and maybe other things that you don't really care about that are distracting. So you can see that there's a, a difference there Oops, between those. So, and this is, now this is using a 10 and a half millimeter fisheye lens and I was getting distortion, but I brought that, this is a good, good a reason to break that rule of thirds. Rather than have that horizon on the top or on the bottom or something like that, I put it right across the center because otherwise I was gonna get this bowing effect and this is kind of what it would be doing. Different location, this is Bryce Canyon different location, but the same kind of a thing. This distortion you get from the 10 and a half, 10 and a half millimeter lens. So this is great because I can really see a lot of this uh, canyon. And this is actually an interesting thing. Growing up on the, on the East Coast, um, there wasn't a lot of places other than maybe being out in the water um, where you would see just a wide expanse where you could you know, um, kind of feel like you're taking in such a huge amount of stuff at once. And when I went on a couple of these trips out uh, Southwest US, I found myself using the fisheye lens and always shooting wide because I was like, you know, I have to shoot it all, I have to get it all. And um, it, it's, you just, first of all, you can't, you can't reproduce what you see when you're out there. It's just, you can't really imagine how it actually looks. It really is just incredible to see. Um, but remember that there are subtle details. There are little things in the distance. And if you crop in and you move in and go back to the, you know, the things I was saying before, just because it is so massive and huge doesn't mean that you, need, you don't need to represent it all at once in a single shot. So again, going back to your, um, you know, using uh, selections of lenses and things, um, you have to consider, consider that, you know, your peripheral vision when you're out there kind of adds to your experience. And not only that, but um, you see things with three-dimensionally with two eyes. And when you shoot it, you know, unless you're shooting with some kind of a 3D camera, you're basically producing a 2D image. So you have to think of ways to kind of convey that depth. And one of the things you can do is um, kind of place things at your foreground, middle ground, and background to show that depth. And I was mentioning before having the tripod down low. That's one of the tricks you can do is if you show the ground as it kind of goes away, you can see, you know, the way the ground looks, whether it be the street or the, you know, grass or whatever, and then still include that far off distant uh, object. Another thing is when you're shooting something like this, it's hard to get a sense of how big is that. And uh, having something that you can look at in the photo and, and use as a gauge for scale is really helpful. Um, so here's an example of a photo um, of, this is in Zion Canyon. And this is actually uh, seven or eight photos stitched together. A, this is basically producing a 50 megapixel image out of you know, several 12 uh, megapixel shots. Uh, so now this is what was happening on that wall in the distance. And you don't realize it because uh, it adds that perspective. And it, unless you zoom in and capture something like that, you don't, and, and even from the shot, you can't see the size of it. But I just made a quick um, little screen capture video here showing that this is a couple of shots now transitioning from one photo to the other. But you can zoom out and you can see that these are climbers on a portal ledge doing a multi-pitch climb. And then you can kind of get the sense for how big that wall really is. Because otherwise, you look at the trees in the foreground and you think, well, it could be maybe 500 feet or maybe it's 10,000 feet. You just don't really know, you know? Other than the fact you don't see snow on top, there's really no indicator. Um, I think that was 200 millimeter. I think it was 200 millimeter. It might have been, a, it might have been that 400 millimeter lens, um, but I don't typically use the 400 millimeter lens at 400 millimeter, um, especially if I'm going to be uh, stitching together images because it does tend to get a little softer at beyond 200 millimeter. So this is, I was mentioning the friend and I who um, go on these trips sometimes. This is he shooting from a really low uh, tripod angle. This is entering uh, Kodachrome Basin. And again, the, the roads, this is actually not where he was, but I was just to illustrate the point. 
Um, this is shot at head level, and then this is shot at ground level. And so it just kind of adds like a different sense. The road feels like it's a little bit bigger there. You can see the cracks and the grit and the detail. And both of these photos I did process using uh, that HDR uh, technique, the Photomatics uh, program. And I'll, I'm actually going to show a quick demo of that in a minute. But um, basically it adds the detail in the sky and it also kind of adds a little bit more of the texture and, and, um, and you can use it to bring in more color if you want to, but um, that's not always a good thing to do. Uh, interesting thing is we were, this is um, Valley of Fire State Park, if I'm not uh, wrong, and we saw this little pullover spot. You can see the shoulders a little wider there, and the road had this little interesting S-curve, and that's one of the, the, one of the kind of uh, things that, again, if you're going back to the rules or things to look for, one of the things that a lot of times you'll hear people is to look for threes or look for S's and different things that you want to kind of frame in your shot. So I thought this made an interesting uh, photo. The, the middle of the road as it goes, uh, out into the this distance is on that right hand third and my uh, my horizon area is sort of at that bottom third um, but then looking at that and I thought maybe this would look more interesting if I kind of focus more on that little s curve area and you know and again so nothing says that you have to shoot everything horizontally nothing says that you have to shoot everything level for that matter you know sometimes there's certain shapes and things that are going on that it's okay to you know kind of break that rule of I got to make sure I don't, you know, get a little bit crooked. You know, in this case, it's very crooked. An interesting thing was uh, Scott Kelby, who uh, produces a lot of books. He's a, the the um, president of the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. Put out this book um, about digital photography uh, with Photoshop for digital photography, and it just so happens that he was in the same spot when we first saw this photo. My friend Tim and I, I didn't think it was my photo because it looks like he's a little further down the road, just by a tiny bit. But uh, my friend Tim said his photo was so close to this that he had to really compare to see if this was the same photo. And it's not. It's just, it's just you know, looking, seeing things photographically, you, something catches your eye, and this is probably a common place that people pull over. And there's nothing there that would indicate that this is like a photo op or anything. It just, you know, catches people's attention in that way. So again, showing that sense of scale, this is down in Bryce Canyon now. And when we first got there earlier in the day, it was in the middle of a snowstorm. So that's why this is earlier in the day when the sky is still really uh, pretty um, overcast, but you can see there, kind of in the center there, there's a person walking on the trail, and that gives a little bit of a sense of uh, the, the height there. And then using foreground elements to kind of give that sense of depth. So this tree we thought was really kind of cool because, you know, the, the wind is blowing away the dirt so much that it looks like it's almost walking there, you know. Um, but the, the little tree to the left and the one to the right kind of add that sense of the foreground, and then you've got this bigger formation in the middle ground to the left there, and then just off in the distance all the, the stuff that's kind of obscured by the, the weather. Not to mention yes. <laughs> what lens was that? Um, ten and a half millimeter fisheye. So this is an example of, this is back in, um, I believe this is Valley of Fire State Park, and getting the camera really low. This is um, how the image came out of the camera as a raw file without any editing or anything like that. And I wanted to quickly show um, how you can use photomatics to compress the, the, the uh, tonal range or the contrast range a little bit. So in this case, um, if you want to keep the detail on the ground and not you know, basically have the sky blown out, you can do some things in camera raw as well. And I'll show that an, an example of that as well. But this is what came right out of the camera. And then uh, basically dragging a single raw file down to photomatics. It launches photomatics and it's going to create what it calls a pseudo raw file. It's not actually a raw file. To make a raw file, I'm sorry, to make an HDR file, you have to have multiple exposures because you're actually adding to the bit depth, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. But you're not actually increasing the bit depth beyond the 14-bit or the 12-bit image that it's, that it's capturing. Um, but it looks at the values that are in there, and if you're in your sort of digital dark room, you'll notice you can, you can adjust your sliders, and you can bring back the sky, or you can bring up the, the, the dark areas. Well, photomatics basically is taking this and um, compressing those tones so that way it is in more of a uh, more of a visual kind of range that would work. And so the four that it actually comes with, this is the natural one, the settings, I should say the presets, the smooth skies, this is the, what do they call that, painterly, and the last one is grunge. Those are the four that it comes with. And this is why HDR gets a bad name, because a lot of people just say this is the one and it's, you know, it's crazy and I love it. And, but you can see if you can fine tune it, there's a lot of controls. It takes a long time really to really get the hang of using something like Photomatics. But you can do something that is going to bring it back more into what it truly was like, maybe what it was like with a little bit of extra kick, just so that way it's still within a, b a believable range, 
but um, you know, it does something that kind of adds a little bit more to the to the quality of it, in my opinion, a lot of times. Do you normally shoot raw? Almost always. Oh. I, I, unless there's some reason, like for example, I'm running out of space on a card, or I don't plan on doing any post processing, and I just want to give somebody a couple quick shots because I want to get quick to you know quick to web or whatever. Um, I almost always shoot raw, yeah. So again, this is the before and then the after using that HDR processing. So again, um, if you're shooting raw, uh, a lot of people equate raw to having like the digital negatives where a JPEG is like having the print of it. Um, with your negatives, you can go in the dark room and you can do a lot of things to it and you can make exposure adjustments. Whereas if you have your JPEG, sure you can do some things in Photoshop or you can make some adjustments, but there's no extra data there. So you can kind of, kind of like tint it or affect it, but there's nothing to really pull from to recover blown out areas or dark shadows and things like that. Um, so, and because, and the reasons to shoot raw is because the camera doesn't always necessarily get it right. If it's trying to evaluate the light in an area, if you have a really dark spot or a really bright spot, if it's trying to include that into the total range to try to, to make the exposure, you may or may not want to put as much emphasis on those spots to, to, to be able to get the shot that way. So, um, so this is that same image, and now I'm going to show you how you can get that sort of an HDR kind of a look just using Camera Raw, uh, which is basically a sort of plug-in, I guess if you want to call it that. It's a, it's a sidecar application that is, comes with Photoshop. So if you buy Photoshop, you get Adobe Camera Raw with it. And this is what, what I use to process my raw images. I don't use uh, Lightroom or... Um, or uh, Apple as Aperture or anything like that. So, so basically, you open it up in Camera Raw, and then you've got, in this case, your exposure adjustment. You can darken or lighten this. So, I'm a couple of just this is again very specific to, to get this look. I increase the fill light, which basically brightens up the dark areas, but then I take my black levels up, which, if you look up at the histogram, it basically just took my histogram and it spread it back out to fill left to right. And if you don't know about histograms, I'm not going to go too, into it too much now, but um, it's basically taking my dark levels and bringing them all the way down to be truly dark. And then I'm using a linear gradient kind of a filter to linearly darken the sky, but it's actually pulling from the extra sensor data that's there to fill in with detail, not just darken it. And so by doing that, I, I don't have the sky being blown out as much. And then you can also do things like you could cool it or you can warm it up, depending on if you want to make it look like it's a different time of day or whatever it might be. But you can get these kinds of effects. Um, and again, this is just a real quick, quick and dirty um, to show you how you can kind of get similar to, but this is the, the shot from the camera raw, the original, there's the HDR one, and again back to the, the raw file and back to the kind of the one that I did in, in camera raw. Um, so typically you're doing uh, high dynamic range photography, like I was mentioning, with multiple shots. And you can do uh, several, several shots. This is a quick, quick example of how and why you might do it with three. Um, this is uh, Zion Canyon, the, the peak on the right there is called Angel's Landing and with the sun off to the right side it's very dark and you can see that the sky and the, and the faces on the left side are very lit. So if you use bracketing and if anybody doesn't know how to do bracketing I can show, uh, show you kind of more of a hands-on when we're out shooting but you basically can set the camera to automatically shoot what it thinks is the correct uh, exposure and then shoot one or however many stops under and then also shoot one or more stops over. So now the difference between these is now you've got color in the sky, you've got detail in the rocks over here, you're losing everything in here though. But if you go over one stop, now this is, looks horrible over here, but you've got detail in these dark areas. And then you can take that and combine it in um, Photomatics or some other processing application and it'll basically combine the data to kind of give you the full range of what's, uh, so what's there. So. Um, if you're thinking about kind of analog light being converted into a di digital image, um, if you shoot JPEG, you're going to have typically a 16-bit uh, image. Um, I'm sorry, 24-bit image, which basically means you've got eight bits of color per color channel of red, green, and blue. So on each of those color channels, you've got only 256 colors to pull from. And a lot of times, if you see people do editing and things in Photoshop, um, if they're working with these 24-bit um, images, you'll see like what they call banding in the sky or in areas where there's like a linear color change across light blue to dark blue or something like that. If they make some drastic changes, you'll see like lines appear because there's not a whole lot of data there. And when they kind of pull out that uh, range or something, it fills in with 
gaps because it doesn't really know what to do with this area. And it tries to kind of interpolate and things like that, but it really doesn't have any data that would go in there. Um, if you're shooting raw, suddenly the next three down, the 10, uh, 12, and 14 bit um, per color channel is where you're coming to. So that D7000 that we, sh we talked about in the beginning of the uh, presentation, that was, that's the Nikon camera that shoots 14 bit raw files, that shoots 16,000 colors per color channel. And if you look the links down to the, uh, the 42 bit, that basically when you combine the three color channels, now instead of being 24 bit with 16 million colors of, uh, in your image, you've got four, what is that, quintillion, is that what that is? Four quintillion colors. Now not a whole lot of applications can really view that and honestly monitors, almost all the monitors that are, that are out there only can produce and, and show you a 24 bit image. But when you're doing your editing, all that extra data comes in really handy, whether you're going to be doing exposure, you know, exposure things or working with an HDR file where you're doing tonal compression or whatever it might be. Uh, but that just shows you the drastic, drastic difference between a JPEG file, which has 256 colors uh, per color channel or a total of uh, 16 million colors versus shooting raw. So that's, that should hopefully convince everybody to never shoot JPEG again unless they don't care about their photos. So, but just because you could do all these things to pull back and fill in the shadows and do all this doesn't mean necessarily that you always want to. And again, just because you can do these things doesn't mean you should. So here's an example of leaving the silhouettes there. This is um, sunrise out in the Chester River uh, in the fall. And I, I like the fact that this was really silhouetted and I didn't really want to fill in and, and you know, show people's faces and stuff in that way. And um, this kind of gets in a little bit of um, that whole, you know, the local knowledge, uh, knowing what when, where to go and when to go there to produce good images. You know, uh, one of the things I found um, being in the area is that the Chester River is a beautiful place to photograph, first of all, but um, in the fall, uh, when the water is still relatively warm and you have some cold nights, you get uh, the fog that forms on the water, you get birds migrating. Um, if it's not too late in the season, if you're interested in it, you'll still have rowers that are out there. Um, and if you go in the first weekend in November, you'll have the Sultana downrigging weekend. So you potentially have these big, you know, uh, tall ships and things that you can see out there as well. Um, it's kind of interesting because Chester River being as undeveloped as it, as it is in some places, it's almost like looking back in time to see these old boats on a relatively undeveloped river. And it's kind of a really interesting thing to see that way. So that local knowledge is something that you should definitely not under, underestimate. If you're planning a trip or if you're, you know, going someplace that you're not really familiar with, try to find what, what you can about that area as much as you can. And that's one of the great things about shooting here is that this, if this is your backyard and this is something that you're very familiar with, you know, knowing when these different events that they're holding are or different things that you can uh, take advantage of to get some really interesting photos is a way to make sure that just because you show up with all of your gear on a one day that nothing is going to be happening. Good example is I, I, I actually came down a couple of years ago and there was a, a, um, one of these planned um, hunts on the island and I only got as far as the bridge, and then I shot sunset from the bridge. So, um, you know, if I, had, if I had been paying attention and I had known that, I either would have come the day before or the day after or whatever it would have been, or just at least known that and been prepared for that to happen. Um, so, you know, if you're on a trip where you're, you know, traveling far away and you've only got five days, and one of those days you wanted to go to some location that you can't go to now, it's good to kind of know that ahead of time, either have a plan B or know that you can or can't get in there. Um, so, and just a couple, just before we're wrapping it up here, a couple little side notes. When you're out shooting, I went through this phase where I was so into shooting the landscape that I didn't pay attention to the people that were with me. So you'll have all these trips with my family where you never see me or any of the people in my family. It's just the location, you know. So again, shooting, this is Death Valley. Um, shooting with my friend Tim, another photographer. Um, turn around and take a picture of him and then go back to what you're doing, you know, and he'll, he'll appreciate that, you know, and maybe he'll want to have that to, you know, share or whatever, but, you know, there, there are people there sometimes. So in this case, um, the local knowledge, we were out there, this is at Badwater, which is the lowest point in the continental U.S. I think it's 280, 283 feet below sea level. And these are salt flats, and that's about 10 miles between where we are and the mountain range behind us, which it looks like it could be a mile you could just be walking and then realizing you're not getting any closer. And so we walked from this area where we parked out to where the salt flats began. And we got out there well before sunrise and we set up our tripods. We were the first people out there and we're waiting for something to happen. 
and then people start walking out in front of us, and we're like, oh man, this guy's gonna ruin my shot, you know? So we're almost, you know, mad at this guy that we have to keep on walking out as far as he goes, so to not get him in the shot. So in this case, it does show the sense of scale to some degree. You, doesn't, you don't see the depth of it there. Um, but in the following this guy out there, we realize that there's this kind of a, a land, little kind of a peninsula of land almost that was jutting out into the salt flats. And once you get out beyond that, your view is so much wider. And somebody who had been there before or just knew this kind of led us out there without intending to maybe, and we got better shots as a result. So this is one of the photos that I took later using the, the puddles of the salt, you know, the, um, the, the evaporated water as a way to reflect the sky and the mountains in the, in the foreground a little bit, again, adding that depth a little bit. Um, and again, going out to, uh, to Page, Arizona, where the slot canyons were, um, the, this is actually on uh, Indian Reservation, uh, the, the Native American uh, land, you're not allowed to go in there unless you're you know, Native American. So um, you have to pay a guide to take you out there. But what we found out is it was actually really well worth the $50 per person because not only do they, they take you out there at the ideal time to shoot these different locations, but they knew exactly where the light was gonna be. They're like, okay, let's walk 50, you know, 50 yards over this way. It's about this time, okay. We're gonna start seeing a, a beam of light come down in a minute. You know, we set up all our gear and we're ready to shoot this. And unfortunately, that probably means there's a lot of people getting the very similar shots because you know, people are being instructed on how and what to shoot. But the interesting thing was that this particular day, it was not that wet, uh, it was not that dry. It was, the ground was actually kind of wet and it was not that windy. So there wasn't a lot of naturally occurring dust in the air. And we were getting these beams. On the right hand side is kind of how it actually looks. But the uh, guy was taking handfuls of this real fine sand and throwing it up in the air. And then it was falling in through these light beams and he was artificially enhancing that for us. And we didn't ask him to do it. We didn't think to do that, but he was doing that. And so that's that local knowledge. So again, I've seen photos like this before and I'm just thinking, how in the world is there's a sand waterfall and why does it always go? And no, it's because there's a guy back there throwing handfuls of sand up and then it comes <laughs> over and it falls down. But it makes an inter interesting little, uh, yeah. So, again, that kind of local knowledge paid off in that case. <laughs>